This is a 38 plate bipolar electrolyzer and I wanted to show it before I mount it in its cart and we can't see anything. I've got it sitting out here because I wanted to bench test it, make sure it doesn't leak and I wanted to be able to do some voltage per gap tests. And Basically what we're looking at here, see those six plates I have protruding? Those are cooling fins. <coughs> Man, it's cold out here. And they're working really good. When you touch them, they're really hot to the touch, which tells me they are extracting a lot of heat out of the cell. They get up to about 130 degrees at 15 amps. If I would have had enough stainless steel, I would have had every other plate do that. And I think I'm going to on one of the other ones I'm going to build. But uh, this here is a copper bus bar that I've used to spread out the connection because that cuts back on your cell heating. That red wire there is just a jumper that connects both end plates. And um, there's a lot going on with this cell that I don't have time to explain at the moment because I wanted to show you some illustrations that you would have to see to be able to understand what I'm telling you. But one thing that I can show you is that unlike most other electrolyzers of the dry cell type, they have this uh, useless end cavity with their clear plexiglass end covers. That end cavity is wasteful because it doesn't have another plate adjacent to it. You're just getting waste currents and stuff like that. So what I've done is eliminated that with this steel plate. It has a gasket that's the exact size of the plate with just three holes cut in it. So this end plate is only exposed to the stack in that direction. There's no other little void right here. I've eliminated that and it seems to be flowing okay. I was worried about the dispersal. Also these plates have different size holes depending on where they're at. And I also incorporated a new design idea I came up with, something I called staggered manifold ducting, which is where the holes for the electrolyte on the bottom jump from one side of the plate to the other, based determined on where the plate is. Like the hole will be on this side on one plate, and on the next plate it will be on the other side, so that the shunt current losses have a far longer distance to travel, and that reduces heating significantly. Um, I didn't take much trouble to mount this filter very good because I know it's going to fail. And I don't know if uh, it's from something called SCC or hydrogen embrittlement, but I've had a lot of problems with these plastics. What I have here is a check valve that I had to remove from my torch. I don't know if you can see that crack right there. That's either from hydrogen embrittlement or SCC, which is stress corrosion cracking. And stress corrosion cracking is a process where a small little particle of oxidation will start in a crevice or a void in a substance on a microscopic level and create a wedge force, which can cause cracking. So I don't know if that's what this is, but anyway, next up I wanted to talk about the cooling system on these torches. If you see people building torches on the internet that are 15 amps, 10 amps and all this and it doesn't have a cooling system and they're trying to sell it to you, it's a fraud. Forget about it. You cannot run these devices at that level without cooling for prolonged periods. This cell here I can run for hours on end because I have a copper brazed radiator out of an air conditioner can't use something that's been soldered together in these systems because the lead will turn into powder very quickly. And another thing you can do, I know we've all seen these uh, router speed controllers for power controls, but there's two little tricks you can do to modify them to increase their performance. And one of the tricks is you can connect it to a heat sink like that, which will turn this 15 amp triac into a 30 amp AC triac. You can also connect these triacs, which is this little circuit in the bottom here. I can't really get you up in there to see it. That thing right there. You can mount those in parallel. So you can connect several of them to make a, as high as an amperage if you want. And this triac here runs this diode array which is 350 volt diodes connected in series to give me a 150 volt diode essentially and another thing that I wanted to show you was a cool way of checking the cell temperature I have a thermocouple probe a high grade thermocouple that was very cheap believe it or not but I'm calling it high grade because I've never seen one this nice it cost $14 the probe is stuck into this T and the only thing exposed to the flow stream is just a little point so it doesn't obstruct the flow. 
and it's sealed off pretty well. I'm not getting any leaks. I used goop, plumbing goop or automotive goop, one or the other, to seal this. And um, before when I did this design, I had the cooling system pumping right into the cell. And that caused a lot of problems. It caused a lot of bubbling and stuff like that. And before I fire this up, I want to show you some of the specs that I got during the testing. And when you see this here where it says cell amps, the reason why the cell amps are different from these other two amperage readings is because electrolysis cells and bipolar systems act like batteries in reverse. When you connect batteries in series, the voltage is, is increased. But when you connect electrolysis cells in series, the amperage is increased and the voltage is decreased. So they're kind of like the, the opposite of batteries. They're, this thing is, in a sense, a transformer, which is one of the reasons why these particular configurations are so efficient. It eliminates the need for a transformer because it is, in effect, a transformer that converts high voltage, low current, into low voltage, high current. And it does it very efficiently, far more efficiently than a transformer does. So... These are some other readings that I did. As you can see there at, uh, where did that go? Most I got out of this so far was 4.6 liters per minute. There it is. And that was at 13 to 14 amps AC input. And I'm going to fire this up now on full power just to show you. Oops. I probably should have had that hose on before I did that. The flow system's working a lot different now. It's not raging like it was before and kicking up a bunch of foam. There is some foam in there, but I've been running this thing for hours just testing it. But that is at 9 amps. 10 amps, that's the wattage. I can't remember if I remember to tell you or not, but I do have a triac on my pump because you do want to be able to control the flow rate of your pump for several reasons, and one of the main reasons is cavitation. Cavitation will take place when you're pumping extremely, you know, bubbled up foams like this, so you don't want that. Can't really see the flow. It's just going too fast, I think. So... Now that I've tested this and found that it's not leaking, I'm going to go ahead and mount it. I just wanted to show it where we could still see it before it got all cluttered up in this mess here. But uh, still at about 10 amps there. That's probably about three and a half liters per minute. And that's what that looks like in this particular bubbler. And I'm going to be showing some of the things that you can do with an, with an oxyhydrogen flame that a lot of people don't know about. Um, one of the cool things is carbon cleaning. You can burn thick, hard carbon right off of engine parts and stuff like that. I mainly use it for building stuff, for soldering stainless steel, stuff like this. They're real good for making solder joints on hard-to-solder materials and things like that, but... Anyway, this is the unit, and uh, I'm going to get it mounted in the cart and show you guys the flame. I had to put it all together like that. I just wanted it to look like a badass Russian, or Russian rocket engine, whatever you want to call it, and it didn't quite work out because all I have is junk, but damn, I love cool junk. <laughs> 